All right. This is good. All right, guys, let's settle in. We're going we're gonna to get started. This is exciting. I'm, I'm Ryan, an alcoholic. So uh, welcome, guys. Whoa. This is wild, right? It's a lot of people. I mean, we were, like, hanging our hats. If we get 20 people, we're satisfied. Like, mission accomplished, you know? Um, all right, guys, so thanks for coming. Uh, this is uh, set aside groups who are uh, all these helpers. Let's give a clap. Look at that. That's just. I mean, that's just impressive. A lot of work went into this, and uh, so uh, we're, we're glad you guys could be a part of this. This, this is really good. Um, so the bathrooms, if you guys haven't found out, if you're still holding in, it's over here to the right. Um, do that there. And uh, also, if you're a smoker of the cigarettes, then um, it's out here to the left. There's a couple buckets. Please, come on. The church has been so nice to us, right? Our, our regular Saturday meeting, we meet here. They're great to us. They let us pay rent, and they're, they give us what we want most of the time. And they let us rent this space, uh, so, so they're really nice. Let's, let's be nice to them. And also, be nice to each other. We don't have many bathrooms, so don't push and shove. Um, the spaghetti, I mean, that was terrific. Okay. Okay. There is so much spaghetti. I guess when the noodles absorb, they expand with water. So there's so many, so much spaghetti. Take whatever home afterwards. You guys can eat it on up and pack it up for tomorrow. Who knows? Do whatever. There's also sauce now. That was a request uh, announcement. There's sauce, right? And that's why. That's how I felt. Um, all right. What else is there? Is there anything else? I think we're good, right? So now what we're gonna do is. We're going to settle in, and we're going to go until, uh, I don't know, 9 o'clock or somewhere around there, and, and it's going to be some sort of schedule. It's going to be great. So before that, Otto's going to come up, and he's going to share a little bit about the set-aside group, home group, the, uh, the history of it, and then introduce our, our speakers. So uh, Otto, come on up. Hey, I'm Otto. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm really nervous. I was like, I was telling my dad, I'm, I'm pretty nervous. He's, I'm, I'm going to have to give the set aside group history. And he's like, well, I would be too. That sounds pretty stupid. You know? <laughs> so, so, but I'm going to do it like, uh, so the set aside group, we meet, uh, over there in the house, the little house over there, if you don't know. And, uh, what happened was, you know, I, I was at about uh, uh, six years sober, and I went to the fellowship by the, by the sea, and, and Katie and Charlie Parker were, were speaking there. And, um, you know, and I could tell right away they were these big book thumpers, and I was like, immediately, I'm just thinking, you know, what are these people going to tell me about the big book, you know? They call me big book, you know? <laughs> and so, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I don't want to, when I'm in that state, especially six years sober, it's like, I don't want to find out that there's more to this, you know. I want what I'm already doing to be enough, you know. And, uh, and, and then they, and so, you know, my, my ego is trying to do whatever it can to keep me from hearing this information. And, but what happened was uh, they started describing what untreated alcoholism looks like. And, and um, it sounded a lot like my day every day basically, you know, and, and, uh, and, and me and, me and my girlfriend had, uh, gone out to this thing, uh, and we were at each other's throats, like, the whole weekend up until hearing them, and, uh, and up until then, you know, it's like, well, it's like all her fault, you know, it's like, this is my cross to bear for, like, hooking up with a newcomer, you know, and, and, uh, it's all, it's all everybody else's fault, you know, but then, after, after hearing Katie and Charlie's message I was sitting there thinking like I mean I'm six years sober I don't know I'm not doing AA like I what I've been doing up until this point has not been the the basically what is described you know as in the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous you know and that's an incredible thing to be to be sitting in AA and just realize you don't know what's going on you know and 
And, uh, and, and, and what was so great was like, well, it, it says what's going on here in this book, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so I came back from that thing. It's just, I've got to retrain my sponsees. I've been taking them through wrong. I'm trying to sponsor everybody I can. And uh, everything I started sharing in meetings was just Katie and Charlie. It was just verbatim the stuff from the tapes I was listening to. It was like, and uh, Ryan was like, uh, well, this is pretty good. This is better than what, what he normally says, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so, like, uh, and then he listened to the tapes. He's like, this is the same thing that's on the tapes, you know. And so, <laughs> but what happened was basically how the group started was uh, we started meeting in his apartment because I was trying to take this guy back through the book and Ryan was there and it turned into a group. We started, because we, we heard Katie and Charlie talk about their home group and how they're just like trying to study what's in the book and not even give experience, you know, like what does this book say, you know, and, and that's what we were trying to do and we we're like saying the set aside prayer first before doing it and the group evolved out of that. That was, and uh, around, uh, and, and you know, I think my, our sponsor was like, uh, at the time he passed away, but, uh, you know, we were trying to come up with names of groups and we were just picking out random sentences from the big book and uh, like, it was like we would open the book and just pick or put our finger down and it'd be, say, because my father, and it's like, oh, we'd write that one down. And we'd start voting and then we had all these candidates of names and, uh, and uh, Ryan, uh, oh, no, Tom, our sponsor, he, he was, how about set aside? So that, that sounded pretty good, you know, and because uh, we were doing that prayer. And then we started meeting and, you know, immediately me, it was stressing me and Ryan out because we started this group and we realized we just wanted to study the book. We didn't even want to talk like about experience or anything. We we're just trying to figure the book out. And uh, I realized I couldn't control what people said in this meeting. Like, they're just saying the same stupid stuff they're saying in all the other meetings. But, like, eventually, it just became a group. It be became a group independent of me and Ryan. And that's why I was like, the people are in the group now. I mean, like, how this all came together, it's like very little of it had to do with me. You know, it's like, I, I, I didn't do that much work when it came to this. And uh, I taped those tablecloths on the table. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so, and so when we actually... Ryan actually got Katie and Charlie's numbers. I mean, that was unbelievable. And, and it, it, we had to book them two years in advance. And this is like my dream come true. This is like what I, this is how I wanted this whole thing to turn out. Like Katie and Charlie here and, and giving this message to everybody. It's like amazing. Like, and it's, it's, it's like so, it's so wonderful to be a part of this. And I, I'm really appreciative of everybody who did work to make this thing happy. And I'm really appreciative of them coming out here. So. Without further ado, uh, Katie and Charlie. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was so sweet. Yeah. I thought I had a few minutes. Hi, everybody. I'm Charlie Parker. I'm a very grateful alcoholic. Can Can you hear me? Okay. It seems like um, I can't even hear me very good. How am I doing, Jake? Check, 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 check. Hey, now we're getting there. Hi, everybody. I'm Charlie Parker, very grateful alcoholic. Boy, are we happy to be here. I, I like Charlotte. I like the whole area. And uh, gosh, what a great introduction. I don't know if I can follow that. Yeah, what a what a natural speaker Otto is. That was uh, that was that was really a uh, that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, you know, I think I'm going to lose this. Oh, yeah. Now i got room to move. Give me a minute to get going. Y'all don't start when you get right to work, do you? Oh, good. That's great. All right. Oh. I'm done with whatever. You know, I, I was talking at... Citywide in Austin the other day, the lights went completely out. 700 people in the room, it was black. That was fun. Um, I like it, yeah. That, is that okay with y'all? Man, I can see everybody. Okay. My home group is a primary purpose group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Austin, Texas. We meet on Tuesday nights at 7.30 at the Austin New Church. If you're 
If you're ever at Austin on a Tuesday night at 7.30, come see us. We, we'd love to try to show you the same kind of hospitality that you're showing us, and which is terrific. We just got here. I got here and took a little mini power nap and, uh, and got here. I, I have, um, I'm not going to tell much of my story this weekend, but I, I, had, well, I was in a plane crash in 2003, and uh, sometimes I don't, we crashed into the water at night out on eastern Long Island. It's a good story. Maybe we'll get around to telling it at some point. But... Um, but I uh, uh, picked up a little claustrophobia, a little fear of flying here and there, and, and uh, um, so I, I like. To, I don't like to just go right from the plane to the podium, or you never know what you're going to get. You know, of course, I can't tell you what you're going to get anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, we're really super happy to be here, and you know, and, and uh, I always admire seeing a group get started, seeing something like this get together. It's it's the kind of thing Katie and I have done a lot of. We so we we did a thing like this in Austin one time and and uh, but I don't I don't know I don't have much time tonight. Katie's I've, I've got a timer up here to so you know that that's supposed to give you hope uh, that but it's I just want to cover a little bit of ground. I want to thank anybody who had anything to do with putting this on. I, uh, we've already clapped with Cody and and Ryan and everybody. It's uh, you know if you've. Uh, if you've been to many of these things, you know they don't just come together, you know, and uh, it's kind of like once you've been married, it makes going to a wedding seem really simple because after you go through putting one on, you know, the next thing you go, man, all I got to do is put a suit on and I get to go and I don't have to do anything. It's kind of like that with these things. and. A lot of people do a lot of work to get something like this to come off. And if it's, and if it's like the people at home, there's also a, a lot of people that didn't do a darn thing. But... Uh, but we have a lot of ideas about how it could have been done a little bit better, you know, and, and, and that's why we have a committee for next year. But I, uh, I'm here with my best friend and my wife, Katie. We were litter mates in AA. We, uh, it's, uh, we came in. She, we have essentially the same amount of sobriety. Yeah, uh, um, we did come in at the same time, but she's got five and a half months more than I do. My sobriety date is March 22nd of 1985, and for that I am truly grateful. I just picked up a 34 chip about 10 days ago. And uh, thanks. That's, uh, and if you're new here, uh, it might be comforting to hear that that's a lot longer than I intended to stay sober. I... Uh, I, a friend of mine took a guy to a meeting one time, and, and the guy, he, he went on a 12-step call, and when noon rolled around, he, he, he said, why don't we go to the noon meeting? And uh, the guy was loaded when he got over there that morning, but at the end of the, meet, you know, at the meeting, they were giving out chips, and this guy got up and got a 90-day chip. <laughs> and when he sat back down, the guy goes, what are you doing getting a 90-day chip? You were drunk this morning when I picked you up. And the guy goes, oh, I thought that was for how long you wanted to stay sober. <laughs> You know, and and I can understand that. You know, I mean, it, it seemed like 90 days ought to be enough. You know, I mean, you know, it's like I'm in, I'm, I'm kind of in trouble now. They won't let me in the house anymore. But surely in 90 days we, we'll have patched all that up. You know, but but most of us found something in AA that we didn't know we were looking for. And and it's it's important for you to know that we are just a couple of alcoholics that, that love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm I'm an unapologetic big book guy, but. Uh, um, we're not experts from headquarters sent down to tell you how you're fouling up the deal or anything. You know, it's like, it's. It, but I mean, I have had more than one experience in the in the in the work and in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And and uh, I should warn you that there's times during the talk where I'll say um, we're going to get back to that later. And what that means is this ain't the appropriate time in the talk to introduce that piece of information I'm thinking about right now. But when I tell you we're coming back to it later, we're probably not coming back. You know, I, you know, <laughs> I got a little ADD working up here, and I never know exactly what's going to come out. But um, what we like to talk about is I had more than one experience in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had. It's funny, I gave one of my... You're not supposed to have a favorite sponsee, but I gave one of my favorite sponsees a 16-year chip Tuesday night at Primary Purpose Group, and he said something really funny. He said, uh, you know, you hear Charlie talking about having his biggest spiritual awakening at 17 years, and he just gave me his 16-year chip. I'm not sure where this chip has been, but uh, but I, I had 
I've had different experiences in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If we were just telling a regular talk, it talks about what hap what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like now. But generally, if I'm telling my story, it's what I used to be like, what happened, then what happened, and then what I'm like now. Because I've I've had you know in 34 years of sobriety, I've had a lot of different experiences, and you know a lot of what we like to talk about is what happened for me around 17 years. I uh, I had an experience at, at 17 years that that changed my whole life, and and part of that was it turned out that step one meant something different than I thought it meant for a long time. And step three meant something way different from, from what I thought it meant. We study the big book line by line, week after week at Primary Purpose Group in, in Austin. And it's it's just, a, it's a lot more fun than it sounds like. There's a, you know, there was a time when it would have been, I would not have been drawn to that meeting, you know. I mean, I like, because I, I give good share, you know. I, I wanted to, I, I like to be able to talk, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and doesn't necessarily have to be on the topic, but in our group, we're not trying to talk about my experience with this part of the book, but or, or um, you know, when I we try to stay away from lines like when I first came in or my sponsor said and stuff like that. And we're trying to if our founders had found something, you know, in in, in the forward of the first edition, it says we. You know, most of the time in the book when it says we, you ever wonder who we is? We as our founders, the people that wrote this book, and it says it's written from their perspective, you know, and it says we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So if they found something that was important enough to put down in a book form, and they were able to do it in, in the 164 pages, I should tell you that this looks different. My sponsor is a book binder. My sponsor is Myers R. Before that, my sponsor was a guy named Mark Houston, and I promise you we'll talk about Mark Houston quite a bit this weekend. And then I was with, had a temporary sponsor named Jim Fletcher for 17 years. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, Myers is a bookbinder, and all this is here is a, is a large print copy of the big book that he leather-bound for me. It's one of my—I've seen a couple of them around here tonight. I know Dave's got one, and you know it's, it's one of my most prized possessions. But right here on the title page of the book is the first promise in the big book. It says the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. You're like, that's funny. I mean, I thought we were always going to be recovering and that sort of thing. And, 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 you know, look, I don't care whether you say recovered, recovering. One of the things that I've noticed about AA, in fact, I don't introduce myself as a recovered alcoholic anymore because uh, a lot of times I, I'm worried about turning off my target audience, you know, because, I, you know, I'm, I like to, I don't know about you guys, but I like to form a strong opinion on a limited amount of information. And, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, so, you know, if I hear somebody say, I'm a, there you go, oh, he's one of those, you know, he's one of those, you know. I, I, and so the reason we work so much with the set-aside prayer is because, I'll just do it right quick. God, please help us to set aside everything we think we know about ourselves, the big book, the fellowship, and even you, God. We ask for an open mind so that we can have a new experience. Help us to see the truth. Amen. We say something like that because... When I read the book, my experience was, for a long time, I wasn't looking for new information. I was looking for confirmation. We call it a confirmation bias. I was looking for confirmation of ways I was already right. This ever, it may not happen in North Carolina, but, uh, you, know, you know, so I, I wasn't looking for new information. I thought I might be, but when I'm looking through the book, I'm going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, oh, <laughs> Jay Walker, you know, and you know, I'm, you know, oh yeah, I always say that. I always say, that. And, then, and then I'm like, oh, see, you can't tell me anything about this. I've already got it highlighted and underlined, you know, and and, and so what happens is, I'm looking for stuff that I agree with, and anything that's uh, different just goes right over my head. You know, there's, you ever read your book and just see stuff in there? We go, surely that's only in the fourth edition. You know, I don't, I don't. I don't think that was in my third edition book, but um, we're studying the book to try to figure out if the founders had found a message that they thought was important enough to put in a book form, what information did they find important to put in there and in what order? 
you know, why are we talking about Jim? Why are we talking about Fred? Why are we talking about the mental black spot? And why are we talking about it now? And it's a, it's a different kind of a format, but we've been meeting 13 years, and uh, wow, is today the fourth or the fifth? 13 years in one day. Um, uh, and I think we've been through the book six times. You know, the, the better the discussion gets, the longer it takes us to go through it. But um, we're going to talk about, one of the things I'm going to talk about is my first pass through the steps, and then I had this big experience because, well, I came in and my first sponsor did it. The first pass through the steps was kind of like, are you alcoholic? Well, yeah, I must be. I mean, I, I, I didn't really, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about what it meant to be an alcoholic, but I figured if there is such a thing as an alcoholic, I must be one because I don't know anybody that drinks more than I do. I mean, I've met some since then. You know, this is a, I love AA. You know, I mean, it's a, this is the only fellowship where a guy can get up here and go, yeah, I crashed the car on Christmas morning, and blew a 4.1 blood alcohol level, and we go, 4.1, that's pretty good right there. That's a, that's a, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean what, you know, now it's like 0.8, I guess, is it? Jesus, I used to wake up with a 0.8. But, you know, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, are you alcoholic and do you believe in a power greater than yourself? And we had to dance around that issue for a while, you know, because, um, and, and we, I may talk about the difference in that, but, you know, my, the, the weaker the first step experience is, it seems like the more time you have to spend talking about the second step. You know, when, when you really pound the first step experience, the second step seems to go a little faster, you know. You know when it says, uh, "We in our turn sought the same escape with the desperation of a drowning man." You know, one of the things that I love about working with drowning men is they don't ask a lot of questions. You know, I mean, once you pat, but I, but I'll get to that later. I, you know, but when, but when, <laughs> but. Then the third step was basically, are you alcoholic? Do you believe in, in a power greater than yourself? Then let's get you down on your knees and do the third step prayer. And I did the third step prayer. I, did, I didn't really know what it meant. It, it, it sounded like a bunch of churchy talk to me a little bit, you know, bondage of self and stuff like that, and these and thous and that sort of thing. And then I, wound up, I, write, I wrote inventory, but I wasn't, my first inventory was kind of like a, a confession of all the stuff that I felt bad about. It wasn't a terrible exercise, but it wasn't didn't have the focus of what I see in the book now. And and then six and seven, whatever. And uh, and, and 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 you know. And then and then I went out and made amends, and I was amazed before I was halfway through. And uh, and and then as far as the tenth step, if I really fouled up, I might I might apologize to you, or if I was really scared, I'd call my sponsor, that sort of thing. And then the eleventh step, I'd ke I kept a, a copy of the twenty-four hour day book before reflections had come out. And on a good day, I'd read that that uh, a page out of that book, and I might as well have opened that thing up in the morning, and read it, and gone, "Okay, God, see you tomorrow." And, uh, and and off into the world I go, and I, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't getting what I wanted, and why my life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. And I was hitting hitting walls, and I was in jackpots, and I was uh, I was upset a lot of times, and I was overdrawn at the bank most of the time, and and, and little stuff like that, you know. And and I mean, I so I, I got married at two and a half years, and then at four and a half years, I I had blown up that marriage, and there's a child on you know I got a child on the ground now, and child support check going out the door and I waited the appropriate amount of time to get into another relationship, right? 16 days. And, and, and then I, you know, I run and, so, and I get into another relationship and, and now keep in mind, Katie and I were best friends for 20 years. The, the brother and sister best friends. No sexual innuendo, no flirtation. She doesn't play like that. She was always going, come on, let's keep it up. You know, like like this. But I mean, I was at her wedding. Her kids grew up calling me Uncle Charlie. Uh, we were, in fact, uh, yeah, when her daughter got, her daughter's 50, 40th birthday is today. And, and uh, when she was, when she was pregnant with the first one, can you believe she's got a 40 year old daughter? And, uh, but when her daughter got pregnant, she called me one time. She goes, uh, what's it going to be now? Grandpa, Uncle Charlie or something? You know, that, that, that doesn't sound good. You know, we're going to have to work on that. But, uh, but anyway, so Katie's watching all this go on and not approving of much of it. And, but the problem with, you know, 
with her being my, like my kid's sister, best friend, is the more I irritated her, the more it tickled me. You know, it, it, it didn't bother me at all. And I had no idea I was interviewing for a future marriage. I, uh, I, I gave her a 20, you know, I, I gave her a 20 year free look at me and uh, it was, uh, there are times when I try to run something, when we first started as a couple, there were times when I'd try to run something down, you know, and she'd, she'd be like, have we met, you know, uh, who do you think you're talking to, you know? And, but all this stuff was going on and, and I get into this, um, so I blew that marriage up and, and man, I mean, in about seven years, things are not going well at all. Things are not well at all. And, and, uh, and I got into a, a pretty dishonest marriage, uh, some of you have heard me talk about, but I, uh, and, and I, I, in all honesty, I got to tell you, the most dishonest thing about that marriage is that I was in it. I was in, and when I, when we talk about untreated alcoholism, this is not the period of my sobriety that you would have wanted videotaped and sent into the general service office as an example of a seven year member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was, it was a little rough, you know, and, and, but I'm still very much about staying sober and very much about the, you know, the program and the stay, you know, going to the meetings and stuff. But so anyway, I guess just to round it all off at about, at about, I don't know, six, 16 years sober. I, I, I married the woman I was married. We had a. It's funny. It was the it was the marriage my mom was the proudest of because on the outside everything looked great. I mean, we had a penthouse apartment in Manhattan, and I, I'm a Texas boy. I mean, I'm not a Hamptons guy, you know. And I mean, but we built a beach house out in the Hamptons and, and had this apartment. And traveled all. I'm calling Katie from the south of France and from Crete, and she's just like, oh, gag me with a spoon, you know. And uh, <laughs> And and uh, uh, and so once yeah it was uh, a little but anyway um, so uh, one time we we I'd never chartered a plane but I had some friends out from South Carolina and uh, we were going to fly into Manhattan and uh, you know so they could see Long Island from the air and then we're going to go and go to dinner and all this stuff so we we take off and we're flying and and then, whoa and all of a sudden. Whoosh, and you're like, whoa! I mean, I you know, I, you know, it's like we're in a glider at 3,500 feet, and I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat. I am not a co-pilot, I, uh, uh, but it, it was a little Cessna 210 with retractable landing gear. A lot of people always want to know what kind of plane it was, but it was a little six-seater Cessna, and there was a, a charter pilot, me, and uh, three other adults, and our dog. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the the it, you hear nothing but wind. And I put on the little earphones that they have, you know, for you, that, that the pilot wears. And and what you don't want to hear your pilot say when you when you put on the headphones is for him to be going, "Come on, come on, come on, come on." And uh, I mean, I'm looking at him, and I mean, I'm not, and he and he's, they come on the little radio, and they said, "You're cleared to Gabreski." And there was an, a runway right here at 10 o'clock. And we're not going to make it. We're not going to clear the water. We're not going to clear the trees. We're darn sure not going to make this runway. And he says, you don't understand. I've lost engine power. I can't make land. We're going to have to ditch. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I'm a gambler my whole life, right? Uh, and what are the odds that the first time I ever charter an airplane, we're going to set it down in the water at night? You know, and this is about a year after John Kennedy's experience out on Cape Cod. And uh, so uh, he says, brace for impact. I'll never forget that. Any, anybody know how to do that? <laughs> no, I know. You know and so uh, we uh, smash into the water and it's just spray and noise and, and all this stuff. And, uh, and in absolute silence. I mean, just, and I remember thinking, my God, we're okay. Now, I never really thought we were about to die. When we were coming in to hit the water, I, I, I would have died ignorant because uh, I, I never really had the idea that we were about to die, but I just I knew we were definitely going to have a plane crash, but uh, we hit the water and all this, and then, you know, and about the time there's all this silence, I felt something on my knee. Now, this wasn't much of an airplane. It was a really crummy boat, you know, I mean... <laughs> Right about the time I just something goes whoop and water and I can't get my door open. I get my seatbelt on but I can't get the door of the plane to come open and water go I go up to get some air and there's nothing but water in the roof of the plane. And and that's when I remember thinking, So that's it. We die today. 
you know, in this airplane. And then the door comes open, and I'd like to tell you that my first thought was of my wife or the dog or something like that. But when I felt my feet pull free, when I, I grabbed the roof and pulled, like, the first thing I can tell you that I thought of is, I'm out. I'm out. You know, and I went up and got some air, and I went back down and pulled her out. And then I went back down and got the dog. And out of the five people on board, the only non survivor was the dog. And I mean, it's, it was sad, but I, I bought another dog, you know. I, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, he's a great dog. A little Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that was trained like a Marine. I mean, he's, he was a great dog. But, but, and then we wind up on the news with this little cub reporter that was trying to make a name for himself with CNN at the time. His name was Anderson Cooper. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they had a little thing called Live from the Headlines with Anderson Cooper. So anyway, I, the only reason I tell all this is because it changed everything for me. It changed the, the urgency of what was going on in that marriage. It changed a lot of the stuff that, that I was kind of fixing to do, or that I was getting around to doing, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I came back to, uh, to Austin, and I called this guy named John Henry. And I said, John Henry, man, uh, I am so self-centered that I can't even be in a conversation with anybody. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, when I see somebody, I have to go, hey, Tom, how are the kids? And act like I give a flip about the answer because I don't. You know, all I care about is me and me and me. And I didn't even know it was mentioned in our book. I, I was working a program at the time like the problem was alcohol. And if you and if you don't drink, you get an A. And, uh, and, and, you know, so I, it changed a lot of things for me, you know, because, uh, and, you know, I, I was like, you know, the guy that, when well, the problem is alcohol, is the, it's the guy that's in the meeting going, well, I screamed at my wife this morning, and I burned out of the, slapped one of the kids on the way out of the house, and I burned out of the driveway, and I got to work an hour late, and I looked at two hours of internet pornography at the office, and then I, I gambled a little bit on the internet, and I left work 45 minutes early, and Got a half gallon of vanilla ice cream and ate it in the front seat of the car without a spoon. And, uh, <laughs> but I didn't drink today, and by God, that makes me a winner. You know? <laughs> and we're like, well, that makes you something. Uh, I'm not sure winner is the first adjective that jumps to mind, but, uh, but, but you know, and so anyway, I started, I started going out, and, you know, and, and John Henry says, uh, why don't you meet me tomorrow? We'll go out to the ranch, this treatment center, and we'll talk to the winos. And, and he was an old wino, and he liked saying winos. But, uh, man, we were going out there, and I, there were times where I felt like I was a step ahead of these guys. I mean, I was 17 years sober, and, and there were times where I'd, I'd be talking to a guy, and I'd go, you know what, read the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. And I'd go home and read the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. And, and you know, Mark used to say the ego can be put to work for good cause. Because my ego is not going to let you stop me with the same question twice. Now, when, you, when you're sponsoring, though, I, I want to say this before I forget about it. It's got to be an okay answer to say, I don't know. You know, if a sponsor, yeah, now, but, but now I want to go like, hey, why don't we get in the book? Well, I'll call my sponsor. Well, I'll try to figure out the answer to this. But I, I don't really know the answer to that one right now. And, and, uh, and that way we kind of move together. But. My ego's not going to let me uh, not have the answer, you know, too many times. But, you know, I started, and that's about the time I met Chris and Myers. And, you know, I 12-stepped a friend of mine into this treatment center. And he had a small pill problem. Uh, he was taking 125 Vicodin a day. And, uh, and, and we, I 12-stepped him, in, and, and uh, he just passed away just about a month ago. But he, he did real good for a long time. And, and he met Chris R., the little Texas guy with the patch over his eye that some of you may know. But, and I started listening to Chris. And I started listening to Myers. And then we went to a workshop with Mark H. one time. And it just it blew our mind. I mean, there was, a, there was a guy that called, and he said, I heard about a big book study in Dallas. And I said, I know some people in Dallas. Let me make a couple of phone calls. And I grew up in Dallas, but I've been in Austin for 40 years. And, and so we started, uh, I call up there and I get a flyer from this friend of mine. And it said, Mark H. Big Book Weekend. And I went to Katie and I said, now, we're, Katie, we're just coming back into the deal, you know. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit this weekend. But I, I said, you know, I don't think this is what Dick was looking for. But I, I, think, I know, I think Mark sponsors Chris. And I really like Chris. I bet we like Mark. And so we went up there, and I mean, it just it just blew our mind. And not too long after that, 
Mark moved to Austin, and I asked him to sponsor me. And I was I was able to work with Mark for four years before he he passed away one night when we were in North Carolina. Katie and Bob D were doing a, a big book workshop in 2010, and we got a call after the Friday night session that Mark had passed away suddenly. He sat at my table. We used, we have a meeting at my house called the Common Solution, and. We want to be one voice, one message, whether you're, whoever you're talking to at the table, you should be getting essentially the same AA message. And we meet every Thursday night, and and uh, on one of his tapes, Mark said the, the best AA he'd ever been involved in was this little Thursday night meeting. It just knocked me down because I knew it was... <laughs> it didn't take long. Uh, I should tell you, I'm a big guy. I ride Harleys. I shoot shotguns competitively. I'm liable to cry like a little girl in a pink dress up here at any minute, you know. And, uh, but I knew it was the best day I'd ever been involved in. But it really shocked me to hear Mark say it was the best day he'd ever been involved in. But man, we would sit there and talk. We had spiritual consent with each other, and we're and we're you know, following the path of consideration, the set aside prayer, and just there, there's so much to talk about. But my life just took off, and uh, and. Um, my program changed entirely, and it's it's funny. There's a you talked about it. You know, when you start we're doing some of this stuff differently. You know, I had a sponsee one time. He called me and uh, he said, "I got two more sponsees this morning at the Saturday morning meeting." And I said, "Hey, let me ask you a question." I said, "Before we started working together, were you sharing in meetings?" He goes, "Oh, every meeting I went to. I, I'm talking to every meeting, absolutely." I said, was anybody ever asking you for your phone number? And he goes, oh, no, no. Yeah. I've been thinking about a little Jeff Foxworthy type of routine, except you might be an untreated alcoholism if, you know. <laughs> and one of them is going to be, if, if you share in every meeting you go to and nobody ever asks for your number, you might be an untreated alcoholism, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but. You know, as we started doing the work, and next thing you know, you got guys, and, and your conversations are changing because now when you're calling your buddies, you're going, What do you do when they say this? Well, that's when I'll go to this, or, or, or I'll talk about this, or I'll talk about Fred, or I'll talk about Jim. Or, you ever heard of the bedevilments? No, where are they? They're on page 52. What do they say? And, you know, and, and that stuff like that. We started, and, and it reminded me of that part in, in, work, in uh, Vision for You where it said, Scarcely an evening passed that there wasn't a gathering of us happy in their release talking about how to carry this message to the new guy, you know, and so they're, 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 that's when things changed a lot for me, and that is the longest introduction I've ever done to, to step one, but I just want you to know I'm feeling really comfortable, I'm in, I'm in, yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the room now, but what we're going to try to do tonight, it's not, it's really, this weekend, it's, it's not as much like a big book study as it is kind of a step study or a, like the way that well, the way we see the program rolled out in the book and what my experience has been and because I can't wait to get I like to talk about step one and then I really like to talk about step three we talk about step three a lot it turns out the big book took a right turn on page 60 that I missed for 17 years and and I used to feel bad about it until uh, I realized how much company I have. I, I, you know, it's, it's all over the place. And I was talking in Arkansas one time, and this guy came up at breakfast the next day, and he goes, you remember when you said the big book takes a right turn on page 60? And, and I'd gone further into detail in this talk on it. And he, and he said, you missed it for 17 years? And I said, yeah. He goes, I missed it for 23 years. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I had to go back to my room last night and get my book out and see if it really said the stuff you were saying because I had never heard that stuff before I'm off, and I'm like, I feel you, brother. That's a, I, I had the same experience because we went right from see that God could and what if he were sought to the third step prayer, and we skipped that body of work, pages 60 to 63. It's really not very important. It's just, <laughs> it's just the root of my problem and the basis of my recovery for the rest of my life. Other than that, just just skip it and let us know how you're doing, you know, and you know, and and I, so I couldn't. And we're going to talk about that a lot. I promise you. I got sponsors. I think that are going. Oh no, I got a sponsor who's only read three pages out of the big book. You know, because we spend so much time in, in those pages. But I want to talk a little bit about step one because I, I think I think you can. If we're not careful, we'll rush somebody into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I'm not saying like a, I'm not like a black belt qualifier. You know, like sit down with you. Know, I got to make sure you're in the right room. I don't. 
But I do like to talk to somebody about what it means to be. I think if a guy, how many people in a room tonight have less than one year of sobriety? Oh, that's awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Because in my mind, if a guy goes to treatment, I say guys because I work with guys, but if a guy goes to treatment and he gets out and he knows what it means to be an alcoholic and whether or not he is one, in my mind, treatment's been a success. You know, because there's, I've seen a ton of people that are writing on their four steps that have no idea what it means to be an alcoholic or what they're supposed to be looking for in the fourth step and, and that sort of thing. So I think it's worth taking a minute. A friend of mine says we throw the gates wide open and then we funnel them down into nothing. And he said, tighten, tighten the, we tighten the entrance up a little bit and it opens up into everything. But the first thing, you know, out of all the, the stuff in the book, you know, our, our whole recovery program is in about that much of the book right there. And of that, the doctor's opinion in the first 44 pages are on step one. You know, it, Mark used to say, otherwise you'd open the book and on page two it would say, God gets you sober, God keeps you sober, rock on. You know, but, but if you're like me, you know, I, got, I, I have to be... My first job when I sit down with a new guy is to give him what I call a fatal dose of alcoholism, a step one experience or a fatal dose of alcoholism. I, I love doing it at treatment centers and stuff like that because you can see it when it happens, you know. But so, uh, but what makes AA a big deal is an understanding of three things, an understanding of the problem with alcoholism, an understanding of the solution to that problem, and then a program of action that will bring about that solution. You know, and, and I like to use the analogy of, uh, of uh, um, if I went out to my car after the meeting tonight and it wouldn't start. Right? I got a problem. But I don't know what it is. Let's, let's say I don't know anything. And, and, and I go out there and, and then auto comes out and goes, oh, man, you left your headlights on. You got a dead battery. Okay, now I know what the problem is, right? Am I going anywhere? No, oh, because well, what, what's the, I need a solution. Well, what's the solution? We've got to get some juice in that battery because the battery turns a starter and the starter turns, and then it fires, and then I start to say, oh, okay, now I understand the solution to my problem. But I'm still not going anywhere because I don't know how to get juice into the battery. And then, but then, you know, then let's say that uh, somebody pulls up and says, hey, I, stand by right here. I, I got bad jumper cables in my trunk. I'm going to go over there. We'll put black on black, red on red. I'm going to rev the engine. When I give you the signal, turn the key. Now I've got a program of action that will bring about the solution to my problem. Does that make sense? And there's, there's plenty of it. So it's the same way in, in the book, problem, solution, program of action. There's plenty of There's stories in there. Where people had two out of three, there's pro there's there's stories. So you know, only have, like Dr. Bob knew the solution, and he had a program of action, but he didn't understand the problem. And then there's a certain American businessman. He knew what the problem was. Or, or Carl Jung, when he's working with the certain, he knew what the problem was, and he had the solution. He said, you know, you got to have this psychic change, but he didn't know how to make it happen. You know, I mean. You know, when it says, you know, trying to, when it says here and there, once in a while, we've seen people have these vital spiritual experiences. Well, think about how powerless Carl Jung felt. I've, I organized an AA golf tournament for 30 years in Austin. And, uh, and one time we were playing, and, and the marshal came out. If, you know, and they got a guy they call the marshal on the golf course. He keeps you from driving on the greens, and he keeps everybody moving and that sort of thing. And, and we were backed up on one hole, and there was about five groups sitting there. And the marshal pulls up, and, I, and he says, so you guys are AA? And I said, yeah. He goes, my father was an alcoholic. And I, and I said, uh, boy, I'm way ahead of myself. I, uh, but I'm telling this story. It's a good story. And I, li <laughs> I like the way I tell it, too. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but so, so he, says, uh, he says, my dad was the worst guy you'd ever want to meet. He goes, he was a racist and a bigot and angriest, most bitter man you'd ever want to meet. And he says, you know, he drank all the time and, and just mean as he could be. And uh, he goes, one time when he was in his late 60s, he got sick. And he, and he went in the hospital. And uh, he went into a coma. And he says, we're all down at the hospital. And we're standing around his bed. And his, his eyes are closed. And he's completely unconscious for a long time. And then as we're standing there, one day, all of a sudden, he raises both hands up in the air like this. And he, and he starts talking to people that we can't see. And he's talking about ending world hunger, and he's talking about world peace and stuff like that. And then he says, 
I have to leave you now, but a better man is coming to take my place. And his arms fell down real heavy on the bed. And he said, we all thought he died. But he didn't die. He comes out of the coma, and he says for the rest of his life, he's a completely different dude. He's, he's no racism, no anger, no bigotry, no uh, just, you know, kept a bottle of whiskey under the kitchen sink in case company came over and never touched a drop of it for the rest of his life. Complete psychic change, right? Now imagine how powerless Carl Jung felt when he's talking to Roland Hazard going, buddy, what you need, because remember Carl Jung said, is there nothing? He goes, well, yeah, here and there, once in a while, we've seen people have these vital spiritual experiences. Imagine how powerless Carl Jung felt when he's going, buddy, what you need is one of those, you know? I got no flipping idea how to make it happen for you, but it, you know, here and there, once in a while, we've seen people have these vital spiritual experiences. Now, the funny thing with AA is we have a solution that will bring about, you know, when we get into the second step, you know, it says it, we have, we, we, we admit that the only chance we got is, is this psychic change, this spiritual experience. The book describes it about five ways. It calls it a change of heart, a personality change sufficient to overcome alcoholism, a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. But whatever it is, something big has got to happen for a guy like me to go 30 minutes without a drink, much less 30 years. And, 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 but the big thing about AA is not only do we understand the problem with alcoholism and have a solution for it, but we have a program of action that will bring about the only solution that we know of for this disease. You know, in the 12th step it says, having had a spiritual awakening. And how did it happen? As the result of these steps. We try to carry this message to alcoholics. You know, the funny thing with us, though, is... Uh, you know, if we came in, if if I had cancer and and uh, um, and they and they said, you know, it's like not looking good for you, and I went, come on, man, is there anything we can do? And they go, well, I mean, there's some guys up in Seattle. Uh, they're doing some whack deal. We, I don't know what it really is, but they're getting like a ninety percent success rate. You know, it's like you can't keep me from Seattle. You know, I'll, I'll sell the house to get to Seattle. I'll sell your house to get to Seattle. You know, you know, but I mean. And here we're like, you know, my favorite is Fred. You know, did you ever read about Fred? You know, I, was, I like to say I'm a lot like Fred, except for the job and the wife and the kids and the likable personality. But, uh, but you know, Fred had everything going for him, and, and, he, and he, he can't, uh, he can't, he says, you know, I, I got some of the symptoms you guys have, but. I don't think uh, I've got it like you guys have it. I think I can whip this deal on my own. And, and it says, where'd she go? We heard no more of Fred for a while. The ladies here that had that T-shirt on at Appalachian. Where is she? Right there. Yeah, she had a T-shirt on at Appalachian right up the other day. It said, we heard no more of Fred for a while. You know? <laughs> And, and you know, and then and then later, you know, they get a call saying Fred's back in the hospital. I love Fred, uh, you know, because he's back in the hospital. They go to him, they go see him, and, they, and it says we we piled on him. They piled on me heaps of evidence from their own experience. And why would they do that? Why would they sit there and from and tell their own stories? You know, heaps of it says this process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. That's what I'm trying to do in a step one experience is crush there's is crush that that idea that I can do it myself and, and but you know when I fell in love with Fred is he's he's flat on his back he's in the hospital for the second time they're telling him now he knows self-knowledge isn't going to do it and he says I admitted that I was alcoholic and on my own I couldn't do it but when I really fell in love with Fred was when he goes the program of action though entirely reasonable seemed a bit drastic <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you not love that guy? You know, he's flat on his back reading those steps going, what? You know, I mean, because I don't know anybody that's ever walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, just tore up and, you know, look up at those steps on the wall and read them and gone, that ought to do it. You know, we, we're driven, one step drives me into the other, you know, and, and, it, and it, so what we're going to talk about is, and I, I'm gonna, <laughs> 
First time we did a workshop, I was like, oh, my God, what are we going to talk about? You know, Friday night, all day, Saturday, and stuff like that. And Chris Schroeder sent us a schedule, and he said, you know, Charlie does this, and Katie does this. And I swear to God, my first thought was, I'm going to need more time, you know. And, and we've been fighting over the microphone ever since, you know. <laughs> but, but that's why we got the timer. But, you know, in step one, it turns out, and this is where I was supposed to have been about 38 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> But I hope we're having some fun. You know, I, I like to wrap step one around my story. I like to wrap my story around step one. But, but what we talk about, the, it, none of the stuff that happened to me growing up made me an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic, it turns out that, that as an alcoholic, I only have two problems with alcohol. One happens to me when I drink it. The other one happens to me when I don't drink it. Other than that, I don't struggle with alcohol. You know? <laughs> You know, it, but in the in the first problem with it, it's it's you know where in that forward the first edition it says we have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Well, that's what these represent is the mind and the body, and the body is the first part, and it's covered in the doctor's opinion in the first 23 pages of the book. At some point, I'm going to run through the table of contents, and we'll all write down you know the way the table of contents are laid out in the book, but. In, in the doctor's opinion, in the first 23 pages of the book, it talks about this physical allergy to alcohol. There's some, it says that there's something that happens when I drink that ain't regular. It, it doesn't happen to my sister. It doesn't happen to about 90% of the population. Only about, only about 10% of the population has the potential to, to become alcoholic because of this physical reaction to alcohol. And he calls it the phenomenon of craving. You know, and, and, it says, and this is on Roman numeral 28 in your book. Um, and it says, we believe and so suggested a, years, a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy. We're going to spend a lot of, when you're working with guys, you're going to spend a lot of time on Roman numeral 28. You know, and it says, he'd written a paper earlier where he talked about, and he says that the action of alcohol, it's the manifestation of an allergy. Okay, I like to break this down, but I have time. I'm going to have to do it super fast tonight, but, you know, because none of these were words that I used on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. Any of this stuff I talk about is stuff I've learned since I've been to AA. You know, we were, you know, but it says uh, manifest, it's a, these chronic alcoholics, man, that the action of alcohol is, is a manifestation of an allergy. For an allergy, we're just going to say, we're just going to call it an abnormal physical reaction. If, if, if this whole table and I sat and ate strawberries, right? And then all of a sudden, though, I start swelling shut and I can't breathe and you have to give me an EpiPen and that sort of thing. You'd say this guy's got an abnormal physical reaction to strawberries. And the way it manifests just means the way it shows up, the way it displays itself. And the way my allergy to strawberries displays itself is that not being able to breathe and my eyes swelling shut and that sort of thing, right? And so then, it, it, so how does my allergy to alcohol manifest? It says that the phenomenon of craving is the way my alcohol shows this allergy to alcohol. And so when I drink, it triggers a craving for more booze. And the, and, and the most important thing you could say with anything we say about this stuff or anything the book says about this is hold it up against your experience and see if it's a fit. It doesn't matter if I think you're an alcoholic. One of my sponsors told me one day, he goes, you know, I was diagnosed with a lot of things on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, bipolar, manic depressive, you know, you name it. And he, he said, but it was the diagnosis I gave myself that had the most strength. You know, once it, when he decided he was an alcoholic, his whole life started changing and he knew what it meant. But it, but it says um, that this phenomenon of craving, well, a phenomenon just means it's something that happens, but we're not exactly sure why it happens, but we've seen it happen enough to know that it happens. And that's what makes it phenomenal, is we don't really understand exactly why it happened. And that this phenomenon of craving, when I take a drink, if I was to drink four ounces of vodka up here tonight, I can't promise you how much I would drink or when I would stop with any predictability. And I, I got plenty of evidence to support that theory from my own experience. Now the problem with the phenomenon of craving is I never thought I'd triggered the phenomenon of craving. I just thought I'd change my mind. Right? You know, anybody ever, I'm just going to go in, I'm just going to have a couple, I'm not going to burn it down, I'm not going to do like I did that last time, I'm not going to go to the lake, I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to do any of that stuff, I'm just going to go have a couple of drinks. And then you have a couple of drinks and you go, I believe I've changed my mind. You know, uh, Turns out two is a bad number. Uh, I think I'll have seven. Seven is a good number, you know. And uh, 
And so, but I, I never thought I'd trigger the phenomenon of craving. I just thought I'd change my mind, you know. And so it, it, it helps to look back and be able to see that from a new perspective. And it goes into that a lot. But, you know, it, I love to break all this down because, you know, we act like everybody understands this, you know, on their way to Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I look back, think about, remember when you were, would swear to God you're not going to drink again. You tell your people, I'm not going to drink again. I swear to God this, I, you know, this, and I mean it this time. I'm, I'm not, and, I, and uh, you know, that, that BS you hear about every time an alcoholic's lips are moving, he's lying. I don't agree with it because, I mean, I meant that with every fiber of my being that I will never do this. But, but think about when they'd look at you a month later a week later and you're drinking or you got a drink in your hand they'd always ask you that question they'd say why did you start drinking again and we'd give them the only answer we got which is what uh, i swear i've said that the biggest room i've ever said that in it was 6500 people at akron founders day and it's like a chorus in alcoholics anonymous i don't know i don't know god almighty i don't know you know, and, and so, I mean, I, that's just what I do. I hurt people, I lie to people, and, and, and I hurt people that I care about greatly. And, and by the time I get here, I'm thinking, disease my eye, there is something wrong with me. You know, and I had no idea. That's why the doctor's physical reaction to alcohol was big news when, it, when he came out with it in this book. And so, it, you know, it, but I mean, when we talk about knowing, I, I promise you, I drank at a little place called the Spillway Pub in East Dallas, and a uh, wonderful little place, about the size of these two tables over here. And, and, uh, but they, you know, but I, I never one time wandered into the Spillway Pub and leaned up against the bar and went, "Oh, Bobby, 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 God Almighty, the spiritual malady is on me today." <laughs> you know, I, I had. A, I had a beer on the way over here, and it has triggered a phenomenon of craving, you know, that would just blow your mind. You know, I mean, I never, I never, we don't talk like that. I didn't know like that. I didn't think like that. But, I mean, this this physical reaction to alcohol. Am I alone? Lovely. Um, this, because it talks a lot about this, this physical reaction to alcohol, in the doctor's opinion. And it says, um, once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, Having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things humans, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. And what happens is a lot of times trying to solve the problems blocks out what the real problem is. I spend my whole life trying to trim the branches of my problems and I'm never getting down to the root of my problem. You know, that's because we can still stay real busy with those. So this physical allergy to alcohol is a big problem. Right? It, but it's not my biggest problem. If my biggest problem was what happens to me when I drink four ounces of vodka, what would my solution be? Don't drink vodka, right? Imagine, you know, what's your name? Imagine if Doug comes in here and we sit him down and we go, okay, Doug, here's the deal. You, you, you think things are going poorly, you're in a lot of trouble, you know, you, you got trouble at home, trouble at work, trouble, you know, a lot of financial trouble and stuff like that. And every time you get drunk, it gets away from you and that sort of thing. And he's like, yeah, and we go, okay, here's the deal. Knock it off. <laughs> did, did that work for anybody? You know, Nancy Reagan's little just say no program would have just been great. For some of the young people, Nancy Reagan was the wife of a president that had a, had a little program back in. But, but you know, the, but if the, what comes in is a bigger problem is the second piece of alcoholism. Over on page 23, you really got to stay right on this mic. I can't do it. Over on page 23, it says something interesting. It says these ops, right at the top of page 23, under that first little end of that paragraph, I've written... Looking at the body stops here. It says above that, the experience of any alcoholic, well, what did they say? We're equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in the bodily and mentally, mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. I like to turn statements in the big book into questions. And here, I read next, I read, does, it says the experience of any alcoholic will confirm this. And I wrote, does mine? Does my experience confirm this? That's the most important question I can ask myself is, is this my current belief based on my history and what I'm seeing in this book? Am I identifying with this stuff? 
And it says, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. What they're saying is all this stuff we've been saying about what happens when I drink wouldn't mean squat if I didn't keep drinking. And then it goes, here comes the second piece of alcoholism, which is I don't get okay when I stop drinking. My mo to my mother, it seems like he's a good boy when he's not drinking. But she doesn't understand what happens to me when, I, when I'm not drinking. It, when I stop drinking, my problems don't go, to why, go away. It says it back on Roman numeral 18 again. It says I get restless, irritable, discontented. You know, I mean, I'm more violent without, two weeks without a drink in me than I am when I'm drinking, you know. And, and I'm much more likely to drag somebody out of their car in traffic, you know, sober, a couple of weeks, untreated for a couple of weeks, then, you know, because I just don't get quite okay. You know, I... Uh, you know, I'm restless. I get a little jumpy. I don't like the way my clothes are touching me. I, if, you know, if, I, if I'm inside, it, it's sitting down, it feels like I ought to be outside walking around. If I'm outside walking around, it feels like I ought to be inside lying down. But wherever I'm at, that ain't it. Right? Can anybody relate to that? You know, and, then, and then it's just irritable. Now, irritable is kind of uncool. I don't really want to be called. I, love, I, I sponsored this guy from Alabama that I just loved. And one time he called me and he's been at work. He's a elect, union electrician. He called me and he goes, man, I got a little irritated in traffic on the way home today. And I was, uh, my, my boss irritated me at work pretty bad. And then I got home, my wife kind of irritated me. And uh, I'm, I'm short in the story up, you know. But, but I said, you know, I hear you talking a lot about being irritated. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you probably wouldn't like being described as irritable. And he goes, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> you know, because if I'm irritated, that's y'all's fault, right? But if I'm irritable, that makes it sound like there's something wrong with me, you know? And, and boy, you know, and, and we're going to get around to talking about, I, I, I like to say that I'm in the entirely different angle business, you know? Uh, the, the biggest movement I can take with the guy is moving him from my problems are coming at me so my problems are coming from me, you know, and we're going to talk about that a lot. But uh, but this this second piece of uh, irritable, you know, irritable is just where like you know, you ever notice in traffic anybody going slower than you are is a moron. Does that does that hold for y'all? You know, and and then anybody going faster than me is a maniac. Yeah, you know, and so so all eyes on me because I'm always going to perfect speed. You know, and, and, and but every once in a while I look up and I'm the moron or I'm the maniac. You know, but but uh, and then uh, irritable. Uh, the guy in the grocery store has got 14 items on the 10 item line. You know, and you know how I know that because I counted every stinking one of them. You know. And, on the, and I'm policeman of the world, you know, so on the wrong day, I'm the guy that's going to go, hey, pal, uh, which four of those items do you want to put back, you know? And, and if he comes back with the wrong answer, it's just a bad day at the grocery store, you know, because now i got to explain to my family how I got arrested buying milk, you know? But, but you're like, by God, there is chaos in society, and somebody's got to do something about it, and if not me, who? You know, and... Uh, and, you know, now the other thing about it, though, that we start seeing in inventory is I'm also a hypocrite, and I like double standards. So, so don't step to me when I got 14 items on the 10-item lane, because that's different. You know, I got a story to go with mine, and, and we're going to talk, because, you know, like four of them are green beans, and that really is one item, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. But, but anyway, irritable, and, this, and I don't like the deal I'm getting in, and so eventually what happens is I get so uncomfortable that I, that I need relief. And when I need relief, you can't tell a guy like me, think the drink all the way through or play the tape all the way through or don't drink no matter what because I drink no matter what. And so what happens is I get caught in this terrible cycle where I drink until I have to stop and then I stop until I have to drink. And then I drink until I have to stop and I stop until I have to drink. And if you're caught in that terrible cycle, believe me, there's a bottom below the bottom you know. I always tell the guys I work with, don't ever say it can't get any worse. You know, that just shows a lack of imagination. You know, it's like, might look up in three years and go, my God, I wish I'd quit back in 2019 when things were still going pretty good. You know, and, and so, and then, you know, it's interesting. And the way the book rolls it out, it talks about that terrible cycle, and then they bring about the solution. And it's almost like they go, well, wait a minute, we're going to scare, we may run him off. Let's talk more about alcoholism. And the thing I got to add into that terrible cycle is that there's also, even when I'm not feeling it, driven by discomfort, there's the mental blank spot I have to worry about. You know, that that I might just out of nowhere one day 
just bust off and have it, you know, take a drink like it was ginger ale. You know, so it's it all adds up to a lovely package. And, uh, and but the thing about it is, that there is no good news at the end of step one. You know, I have seen, but I, I I love giving a guy what I call a fatal dose of alcoholism or a first step experience. And I've, I've given this talk in treatment center many many times, and you see the guys lean forward in their chairs, and you can see them going. Hold on just a minute. I've been in and out of AA for 18 years, and I have never heard the stuff you're talking about. And it explains a lot of things I've never been able to explain. It explains why when I start drinking, it always gets away from me. It explains why when I really, really, really want to stop, I can't pull it off. Um, AA is not for people that can make their mind up to stop drinking and pull it off. An egg, a guy that can make up his mind to quit drinking and pull it off doesn't even belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. Egg is for guys like me who swear to God I'm never going to do this again, and I mean it with every fiber of my being, and I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again. And there's that the hopelessness in step one. There is a surrender that takes place when I sit, and all of a sudden I go, my God, if I've got it the way you describe it, I got no shot. I got no shot of tackling this thing with willpower. Trying to stop alcoholism with willpower is like trying to stop a freight train with a butterfly net. It's just woefully insufficient, you know. And, and but there's something that happens where all of a sudden I go, "My God, no wonder!" Because you know, when we talk about the insanity of that first drink, the craziest decision a guy like me can make is to take another run at this thing, to take another drink, to see when I have zero evidence to indicate that it's going to go well and mountains of evidence to support that it's not going to go well, and I drink anyway. And the thing I never understood for a long time is that I make that decision stone cold sober. I can't blame the first drink on being loaded. I make that decision sober because I get so uncomfortable without a drink in me. So that's where that terrible cycle drives me. And there's a, there's a surrender that takes place in that process. And strapped to that surrender is a willingness to go through the rest of the work. That's why we talk about that desperation. It says we in our turn sought the same escape with the desperation of a drowning man. You know, and I love it. I love the, the allegory there. It says what seemed at first a flimsy reed. You know, imagine you're drowning and all that's there is a little cattail. It says it turned out to be the loving and powerful hand of God. But you've got to get me to grab the flimsy reed, you know. It's, it, and so step one drives me into step two. And, and I really feel like the, the more profound the step one, if my step one experience is academic, then my step three is just going to be kind of a mental exercise. But when that, when that step one moves from my head down to the center of my being, I am desperate for a power that will solve that problem. And, you know, and that's when you go, what do you want me to do? You know, and the next thing you're going to hear out of me is, okay, I did that. Now what do you want me to do? You know, and from that point, so step one drives me into step two. And, and step two mainly talks about setting aside prejudice, you know, the things that we, whether it's past, you know, so all the old ideas that I bring in, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, we, we probably will later. We're going to circle back to some of this stuff later. But, uh, <laughs> oh, believe me, I mean, yeah, Katie, I wound up recapping what she said and stuff, and uh, there's a lot of dynamics going on up here, let's just say that. But uh, I think when the, when the book talks about being properly armed with the facts about ourselves, being able to, I don't know which is cooler, having a spiritual awakening as a result of this work or being able to show somebody else how to have a spiritual awakening as a result of this work. But being able to transmit that step one experience will motivate, it can be the difference between life and death for, for some, from somebody coming in. Because if they think, you know, I just like to party or something, being able to smash that, you know, it, there's, if I, if I give step one to a guy and he's not a little scared and depressed, um, either I didn't do a good job of describing it, or he's not one of us, or he's psychotic and we really struggle helping him anyway. You know, I mean, because because there's no, there's no good news at the end of step one. The, the end of step one is that I have no shot on my own power. But what it does is it rolls into step two. And I'm, I'm curious to see what Katie's going to do. But 
We're going to take a little 10 minute break and we'll just keep this thing rolling through tonight and tomorrow. And I really appreciate y'all listening tonight. Thanks. <laughs>